sometime around 1967 or 68, when Dad sat in the People's Park looking up at a solid grey sky. It never changes much, he thought, and still doesn't even now. He was smoking a cigarette. I've never seen him smoke, but I imagine he probably did back then, or he tried it at least. His hair was a shiny gloss of solid black, and every so often he'd run his free hand through it and gently pat it into place. It was always pretty stark against his pasty skin in old photos, but it's been wispy and grey for as long as I can remember. I don't mean to suggest that he was cool. Regionally handsome, perhaps, but not cool. In truth, much of the bravado and easy air came from his cousin beside him there on the bench. Now, Henry McQuillan, he was cool. Henry was a mod. He liked to wear an old coat of his mother's, my great aunt Nessa, that he'd had doctored for a truer fit. He had it buttoned up close to his chin and was drumming lightly in his legs. They were in the same class the whole way through school, Henry and my dad. Up until Henry left, of his own volition, no doubt. My dad showed me their confirmation photo from about 1959, where all the children stood in perfect formation along the school wall except for Henry clearly untouched by the day's proceedings, slouched with his elbow in the windowsill. His teacher at the time, Mr. Scally, was an old school and barbarous disciplinarian who once beat him around the classroom with his fists because he didn't react when being hit with the cane. He just rebelled against authority, my dad said. Back in the People's Park, my dad took another draw on his cigarette, exhaled slowly and lost himself in the rampant, methodical beat of Henry playing drums in his thighs and humming along. What is that? My dad asked. It's an old traditional song, said Henry. But played like a rock and roll song, so it is. In his early twenties, Henry began making the long trip down to Belfast more often, to hang around the cafes and bars with the musicians and would-be poets. He started playing bass in a band called Taxi, but he was always more style than substance. Taxi, however, were beginning to, well, go places, and were invited down to Dublin to open for Thin Lizzy. They played, and at the end of the night, amidst a steady flow of brimming pints, Henry and the band got talking, and he imparted his grand idea of taking an old Irish standard to a rock audience. Needless to say, they were impressed. Within the year, Whiskey in the Jar had charted at number six in the UK charts and number one in Ireland. Henry had moved to London in an attempt to further his musical ambitions, but perhaps the damage was already done. My dad said that when he came back a few years later, he was unrecognisable a skeletal, shadowy version of himself. By his late twenties, he was in and out of hospital and remained there until very recently. Even then, he used to escape down to our house and sit and chat for a few hours before my dad drove him back, and he'd spend the next week in quarantine for breaking procedure. The rebellious side clearly never left him. He now lives in a hostel near Divis Street, and on a stinking wet day just before Christmas last year, my dad took me up to visit him, and so I thought I'd bring this song along. Henry was sitting by the TV in a stained and faded Albury high-back armchair, sipping something unknown from an old mug. He didn't take much notice of me as my dad chatted to him, and after a while convinced him to have the headphones sat over his ears. A press play. Back there in the Bagot Inn or Lawrence Hotel or wherever it was, his mouth twitching into a sort of smile, a flicker of recognition as it plays. And Phil Linnett's there too, and they're drinking and laughing, the headphones nearly slipping off Henry's head as he rides from the weight of the memory. And then he still as the music stops.
He slowly opens his eyes, stares straight at me and says, What the fuck was that all about? <laughs>